Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope. In this first segment of today's program, we're going to discuss Brexit and all the related topics to that. We're going to discuss about how three quarters of English Tory Leave voters actually believe that Brexit is more important than keeping Scotland in the UK and would in fact even sacrifice Scots if it came down to it. That's according to a new poll by Lord Ashcroft, who found that 76% of Tory voters who opted to leave the EU would put Brexit first, even if it meant that Scottish independence was the price to pay. Um, let's discuss that and of of course, other related topics to Brexit. We're firstly joined by Molly Scott Cato, who is a Green MEP, a member of the European Parliament for the Southwest of England and Gibraltar. She's a member of the Economics and Monetary Affairs Committee and Agriculture Committee. She's also the Green Party Speaker on Brexit and on Finance. She's joining us now this morning from Strasbourg. Um, Molly, thank you for your time this morning. Um, Molly, what do you make of this poll? Um, it's disturbing, isn't it, that um, they would not want this kingdom to be as united as we've been taught to believe it is, um, just because they do not want to remain in the EU? I really find, find it quite extraordinary because we're looking at people here whose party name is the Conservative and Unionist Party. You know, and they've gone into politics to defend the United Kingdom, or they should have done. And yet here they are saying they would be happy to see Scotland leave the Union, uh, to see Northern Ireland leave the Union, which is a serious risk after the latest version of the Brexit deal. And in fact, I think what we're seeing very clearly is that they are English nationalists and they will do anything to, to further the cause of English nationalism. And that's very worrying for somebody who represents an English seat and realizes how that's a narrowing down of our role in the world and really a diminishing of our power as well. So then what does this mean for the United Kingdom then, do you think? I mean, I imagine the likes of Nicola Sturgeon and others will, will, will look at such a poll and be like, OK, this gives us more fodder for, for a second independence referendum. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think the Scottish nationalists are, although they're very worried about Brexit, they see a real opportunity now to have independence for their country, which actually as Greens, we're quite happy to support, you know. But I think, I don't think most British people have really grasped the threat to the union that comes from Brexit. And it needs to be a significant and serious public debate. And the deal that the MPs are debating now has basically been on the table for less than a week and it's been published for just a couple of days. And this is about our whole identity, our role in the world, our position as Europeans. Many of us have multi-layered identities. You know, my father is English, my mother is Welsh. I spent a lot of my life living in Wales. I now live just over the border in England. I think of myself as a European. I think of myself as British. I come from the West Country. You know, we all have complex multi-layered identities. And Brexit is just blowing apart that whole understanding of what it means to be British, European, English, Welsh, whatever. Yeah. And what do you make of this issue of then Ireland and Northern Ireland? Because there has been just a little bit of talk about Irish unity as well, not as much, um, uh, at least uh, when I've been reading and doing research, but there has been some muted talk about that as well. Um, do you think that this encourages that as well? I know that Irish unity is, is a significantly more sensitive topic from what I've understood when it comes to, in comparison to Scottish independence, for example. Yeah, because I grew up, grew up during the Troubles and there was a bomb in my hometown and I remember constantly monitoring for bombs, you know, because there was violence both in Ireland itself and on the mainland at that time. And I think, again, people have not grasped the real change that's proposed in this deal negotiated by Boris Johnson. And the breakthrough in terms of the deal was achieved when Johnson met the Irish Premier Leo Varadkar. And... Of course, since that was agreed that now the northern part of Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, will be part, essentially part of the customs union with the rest of the EU. There's a border created in the Irish Sea, which Boris Johnson promised the unionists he would never do. And immediately Sinn Féin come and say, you know, maybe they'll, you know, this is moving us towards United Ireland. And you can imagine then the unionists north of the border find that a very frightening development. And so I saw last night there was news um, reported by the police chief of Northern Ireland saying that he believes this is a risk of unionist violence if this deal goes ahead. And so, again, I think this is a tremendous risk that the prime minister is running just to get Brexit done in his slogan and just to make sure he maintains power. And all the MPs at Westminster need to focus very carefully on the details of this deal and what it's going to do to the future of our country. 
Why do you think it is then that the, the politicians are not grasping what this means for how united this kingdom is? Because I mean, I imagine that no politician in the UK would want to be the one responsible for the breakup of the union. It's incomprehensible as we sit, we sit here in the European Parliament and we see our colleagues at Westminster really not doing a very good job. And I think a lot of people are feeling let down by their failure to scrutinize and really the way they've been emotionally and psychologically manipulated by the Prime Minister and his advisor, Dominic Cummings. So they're just being put under this tremendous pressure. If you don't do this, you'll have no deal. If you don't do this, you know, you'll be called a traitor. This kind of appalling um, propaganda, really, and emotional pressure, which is no way to make important political decisions and no decision for decades has been important, as important in the United Kingdom as the decision what to do about Brexit. All right, we'll say thank you there to Molly Scott Cato, who is a Green member of the European Parliament, for, for giving us her time and speaking to us there from Strasbourg. Let's continue the conversation. We're now joined by David Jeffrey, who is a lecturer of British politics at the University of Liverpool. He's joining us now from Liverpool. Joining us now from Milan is Federico Fabrini, who is the director of the Brexit Institute in Dublin, and he's also a professor of law. Federico and David, thank you both for your time today. Um, Federico, what do you think about um, any such poll which shows that Tory voters are actually okay with Scotland walking away from the kingdom, uh, if that's the price to pay for Brexit to be done? I, I think this poll is not so surprising at all. Uh, we have known for quite a while uh, on the basis of uh, uh, um, political science analysis uh, that the uh, Brexit vote in the referendum in the United Kingdom in 2016 was mostly driven uh, by uh, an English nationalist agenda. Uh, uh, of course, Scotland, as well as Northern Ireland, by majority voted to remain in the European Union. So it's really in England and to a more limited extent in Wales uh, that voters uh, cast their ballots in, for, in favor of, uh, of exiting the uh, European Union. Uh, and indeed, uh, British politics, particularly the Conservative Party, uh, over the last uh, few months uh, have shifted to the right, uh, embracing an English nationalist uh, agenda, which puts basically England uh, and uh, leaving the European Union uh, before the interest of protecting uh, the United mm -hmm. Kingdom uh, and, and the Union. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, Scotland had uh, already uh, voted on a referendum on independence yeah. uh, back in 2014, uh, but that was before the Brexit referendum, and, and it was a very different uh, political scenario because at that time Scotland would have left uh, a United Kingdom, which was still a member state of the uh, European Union. Indeed. The, the scenario today is exactly the opposite, where uh, the, the, the UK, uh, under English pressure, is trying to leave the EU and Scotland would remain, would like mm. to remain within it. David, I am the likes of Nicola Sturgeon looking at such a, such a vote and such a poll uh, would be quite happy because, you know, she, this just only gives her more fodder and, and more impetus for a second independence referendum. Uh, in some ways, yes. Yeah. So it's it's helpful for Nicola Sturgeon because she can say, look, the Conservatives don't want us within uh, the United Kingdom, so why should we stay? But really, this doesn't change the fundamentals of Scottish independence. Um, there was already one, one referendum that was meant to be once in a generation um, recently. It still doesn't change the fact that most Scottish voters are on balance against Scottish independence. And it also doesn't change the fact that she would still have to go to the United Kingdom government, government to get permission to have a legal referendum on this issue. So it might be a nice talking point um, at the moment, uh, and it might be in the media, but it, it doesn't change the fundamentals. But do you think it's at some level, David, that the that the unity of this kingdom has been hurt through this two odd years ever since the Brexit referendum took place? I mean, for Scots to hear that conservative voters are OK with them walking away, if that's the price to pay to walk away from the EU. I mean, I imagine that doesn't give them a lot of comfort about what this kingdom thinks of them. No, that's certainly that's certainly true. Um, and you can't get away from the fact that whilst England and Wales both firmly voted to leave the EU, both Northern Ireland and Scotland voted remain. That is the country is pretty evenly split on remaining and leaving. So it is a it is a divide within within the UK. Um, and yes, it, it will help the SNP in, in terms of talking points. But I wouldn't I mean, these type of polls. Uh, it's not a serious proposition. It's not. 
that's not the choice that's being offered. Um, so it's more of a talking point than it is, I think, anything serious or substantial. All right. So then, Federico, the, the even bigger issue then is is one of Irish unity, right? Because then uh, that's been spoken about in more muted terms from what I've understood, because obviously there's a lot more sensitivities if we were to talk about Irish unity as a whole. But do you think that, uh, as I had put to David, that, that the unity of this kingdom is actually in jeopardy at this time? Uh, yes. In fact, I actually think Brexit has unleashed very strong centrifugal pressure. And in that respect, I might slightly disagree with what David uh, was saying. I think from a Scottish point of view, the call for a second referendum is more than simple talking point, because indeed uh, the uh, uh, Brexit, the UK leaving the EU, is changing the fundamentals uh, uh, of, of Scotland's relation with, with London as well as with Brussels. Uh, so the pressure for a second referendum, I think, will uh, will increase if Brexit indeed happens. And, and the same, of course, has happened uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I mean, the settlement there for the last 20 years under the Good Friday Agreement uh, had effectively removed the issue of Irish reunification uh, from the political agenda. And instead, uh, during the last two to three years, uh, because of Brexit, uh, this has come back prominently uh, in the in the political discussion. The devolved government uh, in Northern Ireland has been suspended uh, for uh, the last uh, two years, uh, really, uh, and uh, for the first time in uh, uh, in decades, uh, the the hypothesis of reunifying the island of Ireland uh, is now being discussed and mentioned uh, uh, among some of the top. Uh, leaders in the Republic of Ireland. So yeah. uh, I do think uh, uh, the, uh, the Brexit referendum uh, has uh, really shaped uh, the uh, constitutional settlement in the United Kingdom. And, and indeed, the, the poll uh, that we were discussing a few minutes yeah. ago uh, just reflects that for, for a lot of English voters, leaving mm. the EU is now much more important than keeping together uh, the union of the United Kingdom. Do you think that any politician in the UK will actually really be able to to bring people back together? Um, because obviously, you know, Boris Johnson's gotten this deal done to his credit with the EU and has even, in fact, gotten the votes in Parliament on the deal itself, not the timetable. Uh, is it Boris Johnson who will be able to unite the people? Who do you think will be able to unite Britons together? I, I think it will be very hard to uh, re reunite uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, Brexit has produced huge cleavages uh, in the UK uh, of a type we had never seen before uh, in history. Yeah. Uh, the uh, um, traditional division uh, between Labour and Conservatives really does not reflect anymore the cleavage that runs through the country. Uh, the new cleavage is really being in favour or against yeah. membership uh, of the European Union. Uh, in the recent European Parliament uh, 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 elections that were held in the UK, uh, we saw that uh, very uh, in a very clear fashion because the mm. two uh, winner, uh, the two parties that won the election were on the one hand the Brexit Party, uh, uh, a newly established single issue party led by Nigel Farage, uh, yeah. but on the other hand, uh, an excellent performance at the election also uh, was uh, for the Lib Dems, which are a, 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 an explicitly pro-Remain party. So yeah. Brexit uh, has really changed British politics in a fundamental mm -hmm. way. Uh, I think uh, it is naive to think that, you know, we can go back to normal, uh, back to a pre-2016 era. Uh, okay. This is probably a huge historical responsibility of of the Cameron government that uh, didn't really thought through all the consequences of okay. uh, of that vote, uh, but uh, my uh, my view is that the UK will unfortunately remain paralyzed on this issue uh, yeah. for uh, really quite a long period of time. And very well, we'll have to leave those a final word, Federico. I do apologize for for you off there, but we do sincerely, of course, appreciate your time and and David's time today, and for giving us your thoughts and and of course sharing your thoughts about how divided really the UK right now stands. We may disagree, of course, on the details of whether polls can really put the picture, um, you know, fully for us and give us the entire picture, I should say, um, such as this poll by Lord Ashcroft, which shows, again, Tory voters are fine with Scotland, for example, walking away from the union if that's the price to pay for Brexit to get done. Uh, what does this mean going forward for any politician, any leader of the UK, such as Boris Johnson, being able to then unite 
this kingdom um, behind each other, really. A Scottish independence has been, of course, as we know, tried before. Um, and it's supposed to be one of those things that happens once in a lifetime. But will there be another Scottish independence drive? Will Nicola Sturgeon now see this as further impetus for her to then push uh, Westminster to give her the permission for another referendum. We'll have to wait and see what this uh, means going forward, not just for Scotland, but even for Wales, even for then Northern Ireland and for Irish unity also. I'll be back with my next segment on Brexit itself after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here in Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. In this segment, we're going to continue to discuss Brexit, but we're going to discuss the latest about it vis-a-vis -vis Johnson's withdrawal agreement bill, which has passed through the House of Commons. The Prime Minister won by a margin of 30. Now, certainly, this is no small feat, considering Theresa May had tried this very thing a number of times and failed each time. However, just minutes after that vote, the vote on the timetable that Johnson had put forth for this Brexit deal to then be pushed through uh, was disagreed upon, and that has not then gone through. And that essentially means that Johnson will either have to call for an election or ask for a delay or extension, pardon me, from the EU. Uh, what exactly will happen now going forward vis-a-vis -vis this October 31st deadline that is booming, as you well know. Prime Minister Johnson had very clearly said he would leave the EU without a deal if by October 31st there was no deal in place agreed upon by the UK Parliament. That's a promise, of course, he had made early on. Let's discuss that a bit further. We're now joined by Klaus Jurgens, who is a political analyst and journalist who is currently working out of London. He's previously been in Turkey and Austria. Um, thank you for joining us, Klaus. Joining us from Maidenhead now is Azgar Majid, who is a former mayor and councillor of the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead. He's also a consultant at Purity Consultancy. Azgar, thank you for your time as well. Um, Azgar, let me start with you. Uh, what do you make uh, of the fact that Johnson had one very major win, but then moments later, essentially, it seemed that that was just blocked. I, I, I think it was quite a pathetic walk, really, because realistically, there is no reason why the the, uh, um, uh, the we, we cannot discuss this this at the moment within three days, because the majority of the bill was actually what it was before, which is a mess. It's already been discussed. The only real big difference is the backstop, and I'm sure that can be discussed within three working days. Mm. So then why do you think this was done? Was this just partisanship? It's politics. Uh, I mean, there seems to be more self-interest in this than there is actually the interest of Britain and, and the British people and the way the British people voted. Mm. Klaus, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, it seems that um, even if Johnson were to bring up discussions on the elections, um, I know that there's some disagreement even on that. Well, thanks for having me. Um, hello to you and, and my esteemed colleague. Colleague, yes, uh, I would fully agree and continue from uh, what he just said. A parliamentarian plus aides plus research team should be able to read, even if it is over 100 pages of legal text. After all, that is what they are paid for. So the argument we can't just do it in three days, I think, was a bit ludicrous, to be honest. In particular, as what my colleague said, most of the text, except for nuances, would remain the same. So this is politics. This is pure politics, partly a rebuke by those uh, dismissed from the party by Boris Johnson for losing the whip, uh, still saying we do want a certain Brexit, but just according to our own terms, you don't get it the way you want, not until Thursday, which would have been today before it would have been sent to the House of Lords. So I fully agree. This was politics. Technically speaking, it is possible. And now, of course, uh, Boris Johnson has to decide would he want to go to the electorate before December. He said a short while ago he would if mm. the EU grants a longer extension. Now, Emmanuel Macron said same a short while ago. He would prefer a November 15th election. So I need mm. my crystal ball, like most of us would. Will yeah. there be a general election before Christmas? Or will he now say we have until November 15th to push my withdrawal agreement bill through, which I still think would be an option leaving on November the 15th. Okay, so then let's talk about that then, Asghar. Do you think that there will be an election or do you think that things will be resolved before Christmas? On the election, I mean, if we're almost there, uh, you know, most of the deal hasn't 
change, this own change, a majority of it. The only backstop is the one to really to be discussed. If we're talking about a short delay in getting this across the line, then we should do it. And if we need to come to a general election, then everyone should support that and let the constituents decide once again which way we want to go. We've always had the first past the post in, 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 in the UK. And OK, it's a, it's a 52, 48% majority, but the majority won. And that's where we've always worked. This is where democracy works in the UK. Mm. Now, so obviously, I as, think as, either, as, either back, back yeah. to the UK and back the people of what, what yeah. they've actually asked you to do, or go for a general election, which you're too scared to stand on because you know you're going to lose. Mm. But then, Asghar, there's also rumors that even within John's own cabinet, there is disagreement, in fact, about an election. At least that's what rumors say. Uh, what exactly do you think the disagreement may be about then? I, I, I don't think there's a disagreement on that. On that. People know that they're going to win on this. Um, it's more the opposition. L let's go for a vote. If you, if you don't want to back the deal, let's go for a vote and let the people decide for you, although okay. they've already decided. Yep. Okay, right, then, Klaus, you know, that is one of the interesting things about all because whenever Johnson has, in fact, brought up an election, it seems that Corbyn uh, doesn't really play ball in that regard. What's holding back the opposition from just saying, listen, let's have an election um, if they're so confident in their stances? Well, I think since a quite sizable number of Labour candidates on the manifesto pledged to actually adhere with the referendum results from 2016, which apparently they don't. And the Conservative Party at the moment leading the polls with 37 percent. Of course, polls are to be taken uh, always uh, one poll, two poll, three polls. Yes, but, but yeah. just, just like a snapshot of politics, I think that Labour is rather worried that Boris Johnson not only get away with uh, the withdrawal agreement bill, uh, even with a majority, if it's only 10 or 20, it doesn't have to be 30, like a few days ago, but that he would actually win a general election without the need for the DUP and without the need for a minority government. This would, in turn, uh, rule out a second Brexit referendum ever. I listened to uh, the uh, Liberal uh, Party leader uh, Joe Swinson the, the other day, and, and she said she would prefer a second referendum over a general election, hoping that Remain would win and mm. then Brexit would basically be over and then a general election, whatever is the result, uh, wouldn't yeah. matter. And I think some in the Labour camp would see it the same way. I think uh, it is a high stake, a high risk, almost Russian roulette game Boris Johnson is trying to play, but with all modesty and, and not talking party politics, he managed to get a deal in Brussels and he managed to get it through Parliament, albeit in name by a majority of 30 votes. It is not impossible that his advisors are right this time and they say, let's go for a GE and we will actually win it. But I okay. heard the rumours yeah. too yeah. Uh, this morning that uh, Downing Street uh, uh, and the Prime Minister and some in his cabinet are not too eager to hold a general election. And my assumption is, of course, politics is politics. It could be if the Conservatives would unexpectedly lose. Of course, many Conservative members of Parliament would lose mm. their seats. I think normally no one would really yeah. love a general election, definitely not the members of Parliament. Exactly. But let's wait and see what the EU finally decides. I think we might know it by tonight. What is the plan? All right, so then, Oscar, let's talk about if you think that this deal, as it stands right now, should be put back to the public. Because as you well know, Oscar, that's been proposed a number of times as well, that put this deal back to the public, let's have a referendum on the deal itself also. Um, would that be logical? I, I don't think so. Think so. The public have asked you, we asked the public, what do you want? And they said, we want to leave. So... We're now leaving. We've left that now with the uh, with our lawmakers to go on ahead and make us leave. Now, that's been going on for two, two and a half, three years now. It's been decided we want to leave, and these are the bases that we want to leave on. So why are you now back in the Remain uh, agenda when we have asked you, specifically asked you once and for all to leave? Why should we have the referendum? And this is what concerns a lot of people. We're going down the European route. Let's have, let's have more referendum until we actually get what we want. Mm. We don't want that. We've told you what we want. Now go ahead and do it.
Mm. That's interesting because, you know, Klaus uh, would say, listen, we were sure we did vote for Brexit, but then we didn't uh, want all of the negative consequences that may come along with it, possibly. And, you know, we, as you well know, Klaus, the, the forecasts, business forecasts, investor forecasts, et cetera, et cetera, have sometimes been quite negative in outlook, at least in the short term for the UK. Um, do you think it's the right of the people to then have a vote on this deal as it stands? Well, I, I was, in, was in touch with um, totally different opposite numbers at the Tony Blair Institute the other day, and uh, uh, the former prime minister suggested let's do have a vote of the people, by the people, about this new uh, bill. And I, I almost jokingly replied, OK, you get your way this time, but then what would happen if I want to have a third referendum mm. a short while after? And then he would say, I want to have a fourth one. I think this would be a soap opera, not meant negatively vis-a-vis uh, Mr. Blair, of course, but in general terms. The yeah. people have spoken. A referendum is a referendum. If not, it should be taken out of the political system. It could have gone the other way round, and then the Leave campaign should have accepted that it is remain. I think a general election is the democratic choice. Another referendum, it, it would be hilarious. How could we ever explain to our children that politics is a noble profession? So I, I fully agree with my esteemed colleague. And I think... Mm. Uh, if at all a general election is the democratic solution, but a second referendum would make no sense. It is not impossible that some people then would honestly, not like me jokingly in, mm. in, in, in my conversation, say we ask for a third referendum. Indeed. What you mentioned, Indeed. if I may come, uh, sure. very few sure. seconds, you, sure. you, you said uh, it was not entirely clear what the vote in 2016 was about. Well, honestly... If anyone would have expected that the Northern Ireland question would disappear into thin air overnight, then mm. no one made an informed choice. It was always clear that there would be a long and lengthy debate about how not to split the United Kingdom, what yeah. would happen with Northern Ireland, and to avoid a hard border yeah. uh, separating mm -hmm. Ireland. Now, I don't think that the public was so ignorant about the fact, only saying, yes, we mm. want to leave the EU, but we do not mm. care about the consequences. I, I, I think okay. the, the British electorate actually is much more learned, much more studied. So now saying changes have been yeah. made, we didn't know what is really going to happen. I think this is more like a Project okay. Fear uh, campaign, to be honest. All right, and that's a good that's a good term to, to end off Project Fear. But of course, we do appreciate both Klaus and Asgar for their time this morning, and of course, for putting this into context for us and our viewers. Uh, viewers, this issue of Brexit is certainly one that has been polarizing. But it seems that at this point in time, Johnson has achieved something quite big. As I said, May failed, where Johnson has now succeeded. Uh, he's made a deal with Brussels, A, very quickly. Of course, uh, we know that on the other details, apart from the Irish backstop, it's essentially the same deal as May had reached with the European Union bloc. However, that issue of the Irish backstop was a very major hurdle in the way of a deal passing in the UK Parliament. It has now passed. But why then not just go through with this deal by October 31st, as Prime Minister Johnson and the EU had set the deadline for then. Um, as both of our guests there said, three days, while it sounds like a very short period of time, should be enough for, as they said, researchers and politicians who are essentially paid for this very sort of thing. Uh, will general elections then be around the corner? Will a second referendum even occur? What exactly happens then? October 31st or the day after? We'll keep a close eye on that, of course, here in Scope. I'll be back with my next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss Iraq. Now, U.S. forces leaving Syria, as we know, under the deal that they reached, uh, seemingly with Turkey, have come now into Iraq. Now, when that occurred, it seemed that the Iraqi government went almost into overdrive, where uh, we've had a number of spokesmen from the Iraqi officials saying that these forces cannot stay in the country. Now, of course, we know that large parts of Iraqis do not actually want 
more U.S. forces in the country, even the 5,000 that are there, is something that is not being seen as a positive thing, um, considering a number of Iraqis, or large numbers of Iraqis, I should say, do still view what occurred after the fall of Saddam Hussein as somewhat of an occupation by the U.S. Uh, to discuss that a bit further, we're joined by our panelists. Ahmed Rushdi, who is the president of the House of Iraqi Expertise Foundation, is joining us now from Istanbul. Zaydun al-Kanani is a geopolitical analyst and writer. He specializes in geopolitics and identity politics with a primary focus on Iraq and the Middle East. He's joining us now from Doha. And joining us from Baghdad is Mohammad Hussein, who is policy director at the Iraqi Center for Policy Analysis and Research, which is an independent research center. Mohammad Zaydun and Ahmed, thank you all three for your time today. Uh, Ahmed, let me start with you. Um, it seems, Ahmed, at least on the outside, that there was no coordination on the part of the U.S. when it came to these forces leaving Syria, entering Iraq. Um, do you think that very much the U.S. still views Iraq as really a territory that it can do as it so pleases? Well, well, actually, it's, it, it doesn't look like that. Uh, the withdrawal happened as fast as possible from Syria. The, the, the nearest base for the Americans is, is in Ambar. So I think it's more about how to deal with the situation, about really military forces, how to withdraw military forces, how to try to manage all those things. It's, uh, it looks like that, uh, apparently. But maybe, uh, just maybe, it's going to be something else. Especially, they made a timeline saying that we're going to stay for about four weeks or six weeks in Iraq. Then we're going to withdraw from Iraq. It, it depends. So it depends after six weeks what's going to happen. Okay. Zaydun, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, the optics certainly weren't good, were they, Zaydun? You had Esper saying, okay, these forces are going into Iraq. They went into Iraq. We saw the images of that. And then we had an Iraqi military official, I believe it was, saying, and even uh, Adil Abdul Mahdi saying, these forces cannot stay. Of course, Wakar. It's contradicting statements from both sides, even contradicting statements within the Iraqi military or the Iraqi state in itself. Um, politics never taught us that there will be never be contradicting statements. In fact, politicians themselves act in contradiction to their very own statements. Trump's decision in withdrawing U.S. troops from Syria and leaving his former Kurdish allies to face the Turkish army and his suspicious return to Iraq are two actions that cannot be easily analyzed. Most analysts will also hardly believe that the U.S. army is getting closer to Iraq to protect it from the ISIS resurgence that it claimed, especially when the statements are contradicting between both countries. But I think the, the, the three main possible scenarios that could happen out of this is that either the U.S. wants to maintain a foot near Syria, Iraq in this case, now that it left most of Syria to Turkey and Russia in a very uh, in a very fast, hurried decision, or the U.S. is aware of the anger and the youth-led uprisings on the Iraqi streets today. Uh, the protests in Iraq are returning tomorrow, October 25th, after giving the government a chance of a few weeks to resign. And this could result, obviously, into a major transformative change in the Iraqi system and politics. And the U.S. probably wants to ensure a stronger presence during such a possible transition. Or finally, the U.S. might be challenging the Iranian militias in Iraq by wanting to rebalance its military influence with Iran in Iraq, since it left a militarily vulnerable Iraq for years for Iran to establish itself Very interesting. as a unilateral, aggressive and influential player in Iraqi domestic affairs. Mohammed, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, Zun put a, a couple of options there out. And I, I've, I've wondered as well, why do you think it is that the Iraqi officials reacted in the way that they did to the, the, the you know, these U.S. forces coming into the country over, of course, the 5,000 that are already there? Do you think it is a lot to do with just domestic consumption where we have these protests happening, where we have the PMUs, the Popular Mobilization Units, still very large a force and very influential throughout the country? Is it this a balancing act to try to keep everybody happy? Um, I would say like that the Iraqi position of regarding this issue is actually a little bit clear. It doesn't need to be that much confused. So we saw that the defense minister, uh, Amari said that the U.S. Uh, withdrawn forces from North Syria have like four weeks to leave Iraq. So they basically use Iraq as a like, uh, transition point and then uh, they would finally and ultimately leave Iraq to go to, to go back to U.S. or stay in the, some uh, Gulf Arabian countries. 
So uh, the, the thing is, uh, Iraq, uh, like uh, reporting from the, the top Iraqi officials, Iraq do, does not need this uh, new U U.S. forces in the country, and actually their presence may, may, may become liability, uh, taking into account the regional tension between Iran and Iraq and between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and the other countries. So it's clear that the Iraqi leadership wants to avoid all the complications that may associate with the new, new U.S. Uh, forces uh, that entered Iraq in the past uh, two days. So it's clear that the Iraqi leaders uh, really don't want to uh, add more complications to the already problems uh, we have with the neighboring countries and with the tensions uh, between the U.S. and Iraq. So okay. it seems that the, the U.S. Yeah. Uh, leaders and officials also understand this point. Zaydun, what, what, what do you think about that? Because the instability politically within Iraq, I imagine, certainly influences how the Americans view this entire situation. I mean, from an American point of view, they have the perfect cover to stay in Iraq, don't they? The fight against ISIS continues, um, and that's been something that's you know, been rhetorically repeated a number of times by many U.S. officials. Um, then, of course, we've also had you know, Donald Trump, you know, again, just using rhetoric, saying that he doesn't want to stay in long, blood-stained sands. And he was referring, of course, there to Syria, but I imagine you could, you could stretch that to all of the Middle East, really, when he was speaking about that. But that's not really true, though, is it? I mean, he very much would want to stay in the Middle East. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Wakar. I don't think uh, taking uh, Donald Trump's word would be a strategic way of trying to analyze what's going on in the region, even if we were to analyze his very own policies. Um, the U.S. troops coming back to Iraq means one of the two things. It either, it either means that things are really bad and they're coming for something to do the opposite because that bad thing is not really working out for them, or it means that they're going to do something bad, which they did in 2003 when they invaded the country. Mm. Having uh, the U.S. military return to Iraq never gave us a good indicator. It was never a good sign. The, the bad signs now would be that there is something that might happen, as our colleague mentioned. There is something that is that might be happening that we don't know about, which is why the U.S. Army wants to be in the picture. Hmm. Or there is something that the U.S. wants to do in Iraq. Very well. All right, we'll leave final word, in fact, because we have run out of time. But of course, we do appreciate all three of our guests for their time. That was Ahmed, Zaidu, and, and Mohammed, of course, putting this all into context for us and uh, sharing their thoughts with us on this, because it, it's certainly an important situation, viewers. Um, Iraq right now, as I'd put to Zaidu and as well and our other guests, is going through political instability. But at the same time, we've had this rushed withdrawal, seemingly rushed, rushed withdrawal from Syria of some U.S. forces. Mind you, there are still U.S. forces there protecting, quote unquote, oil fields in Syria. Um, and then what does this mean for the fact that these Iraqi officials, military as well as political leaders of Iraq came out again in very rushed statements saying, listen, these U.S. forces can't stay. Then we had Mark Esper, the U.S. official going there, and then now a deal seemingly has been reached about uh, these forces staying in Iraq only for about a month, four weeks is what we've heard, upwards maybe two, six weeks, as Ahmed there alluded to as well. Um, this is all very important, specifically timing-wise, and where Iraq is is placed. It's right beside Iran. And of course, it's going through its political instability. Does the US know something about what's to happen in the coming days that the rest of us don't know? We'll, of course, keep a very close eye on that. I'll end it there for now. But of course, do please check out Indus News on all of our social media links. It's indus.news, the word dot, throughout social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Mokar Thanks for watching.